comfort for mankind. Here in chapter 43, God continues proclaiming that good news, that comfort, by reminding the people of Israel, the tribe of Judah, and ourselves today exactly who God is. He tells us that he is the creator of the world. He reminds us that he is Lord Almighty. He reminds us in a very poetic but very pointed way that since he is God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and we are his creation, who are we to question him? But he doesn't stop there. He continues in many different ways sharing the comfort that is expressed in this verse. One example he says in verse 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. This is the word of God. This, the first Sunday after Christmas, this time in between the celebration of Christmas and New Year's is kind of a time of transition. I would even say more so than the first days of the New Year. It might be because perhaps if you have families, school is out and, and, and things perhaps in some ways for many people, not everyone, but for many people, things might slow down a little bit. Or at least there are shorter work weeks if you get, as it happens this year, that Christmas and New Year's is on a Friday and so you get two long weekends together. Again, not everybody falls into that category, but it's kind of a general feeling. It's a time of transition, and it's a time of looking back and a time of looking forward. Again, we look back in different ways, and we look forward in different ways. I think it's exempl a great example of that is yesterday I spent a little bit of time with my family, and we went out, and we did some things, and of course, as we were running errands and doing various things, we had to stop at the store for some basic items, you know, milk, bread, that type of thing. And walking through the store, you could see that we were in transition. Because all the things, all the Christmas decorations, all the Christmas goodies, all the Christmas coffee mugs, all the Christmas whatever was no longer prominently put out there in the center aisle, front and center, so that everybody could see. Now it's all moved back to a special section with big signs saying, 30% off, 50% off, let's get rid of this stuff. Please, you didn't buy this junk before, buy it now. And people are back there buying it and picking through it. I also saw that we were transitioning and looking forward because one of the little projects we had yesterday was we wanted to get some Christmas candy for somebody and we thought, and we weren't going to see them before Christmas, we said, all right, well, let's just pick it up before, at the, right after Christmas and we can get it on sale because, you know, I'm just kind of a cheapskate. Anyway, but let's purchase it now. So we go back there, and it was all gone. There was no Christmas candy. But, oh, well, let's go look in the candy section. And we did find some candy, and it was decorated in with a red motif, but it wasn't Christmas candy. Guess what kind of candy it was? Valentine's candy already on the shelf. Or it tastes the same. But anyway, another thing I noticed in the stores... As I said, the Christmas decorations were gone. The place where there had been big displays of poinsettia plants was now filled with a big display of software called TurboTax. <laughs> oh, Happy New Year. Anyway, so things move on. Another thing that happens at this time of year, and you see this reflected in the stores, people look back, oh, the big events of 2015, and then, of course, you know, then there's the Farmer's Almanac for the next year, and then, of course, there are some other publications of, ooh, predictions for 2016, all that stuff. But one thing that I remember from this time of year, 
And I don't know, maybe companies, I definitely am sure they do it differently now with computers and even adjusting the time to make it more practical. But I remember at this time of year getting a part-time job at a big kind of lumberyard hardware store. I got a job helping them do inventory. And I remember, I'll never forget it because it's like, okay, it was a part-time job, make some money, but you know, it's like you, you'll never forget this after you spend a day counting washers, counting how many pounds of nail, counting how many bolts, writing it down and putting a tag on it, then moving big, okay, I've finally accomplished this, now I will move an inch over and start counting the washers that are now an eighth of an inch bigger one to 5,000, 6,000, it's just, you do it. But that's what people do, businesses. Not all of them, they've adjusted their fiscal calendars and stuff, but a lot of times at this time of year, businesses used to, and maybe some still do, would do inventory. Well, I think that's what this verse for today helps us do. And it's very right between these holidays of celebrating our Savior's birth and looking forward to a new year. I think it's very appropriate that we as Christians do a personal inventory. A personal inventory of exactly who our Lord is, exactly who we are, and an honest inventory of what our relationship with Him is like. The verse helps us, one of many verses in the scripture, helps us clearly see who God is. It starts out where the Lord says, I, even I am. And he goes on to describe his specific aspect of I am. But that's the first thing I think we need to remember as we begin this inventory of who God is, who we are, and what is our relationship with him. Who exactly is God? Now, based on some comments from Bible study this morning, we know the politically correct, the politically uh, appropriate, or perhaps the more common default desire of human beings when it comes to answering the question, who is God? Mankind has a tendency, and our sinful flesh is not exempted from this tendency, when asked, who is God, we always like to answer, we have a tendency to answer, well, I think, or I kind of believe, or I would like to imagine God is, and then we fill in the blank with whatever we like. If someone would dare say, oh, God is this way, well, no, I think he's more understanding. No, God says he's, well, no, I've always envisioned him as more of being like this, and gallons of ink, and reams of paper, and endless volumes of breath has been expelled on people pontificating on, I think God is like this. What an arrogant way of approaching the question. What a pompous and stupid way of answering that question. Especially when God has been so clear in the Scriptures, when the Lord has been so clear about stating who He is. In fact, it's so important to him that we understand who he is. He has bent over backwards, giving promises and commands, making sure that we would hear exactly who he is. When Moses asked, Lord, you want me to go back to the children of Israel? You want me to go back to Egypt and lead them out? They're going to ask me, who sent me? What is your name? What should I tell them? Of course, we do read that God puts it in connection. He does refer to, I am the God who was with Abraham, who was with Isaac, who was with Jacob. I am the God of your ancestors. I am the God who made all these promises. I am the God who did this and that. But before he said any of that, his first answer was, I am who I am. 
I am God. I am the one who created the heavens and the earth. I am the one who is eternal. Again, from Bible study, no matter how mind-boggling that is, he says, that's who I am. I am also the God who gives promises. And I want you to know who I am, and I want you to realize who I am, and I want you to know that I am who is, and I am the only one, and I want to drill that into your head. Therefore, I am going to, as I summarize my commands, number one, numero uno, first thing you need to understand is, I am the Lord, and you shall have no other gods, because there is no other God. Not only do I want you to know that because that's exactly the way it is, but I want you to know that for your own good. Because as Jesus proclaimed, as he proclaims the gospel, not only is that statement part of a command, but it's also part of the Father except through me. I am it. And that's also what Isaiah was privileged to proclaim. He proclaimed in the earlier verses of the who I am. And there's the good news. As we look at our relationship with God, we need to begin with understanding and take a personal inventory of how are we looking upon God? Well, He is the Creator. He is the Judge. He is the one who demands perfection. I am holy, He says, and I expect you to be holy. But thanks be to God, he's also the one who says, I forgive sin. I don't remember them. I blot it out. And again, whether it is Christmas time, Easter time, or the 23rd of August, what a beautiful picture of God blotting out our sins. And especially today, as in the second part of a service, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we, with 2020 Christian hindsight, can look back and see exactly what God was talking about. What it is that blots out our sin and our transgressions. The very blood of Jesus Christ that was dripping off his hands from his feet, dripping down the cross. Everything that we've ever done wrong are transgressions and sins. 
And those words, it's not just for poetic sake that he uses transgressions and sins. In the Hebrew, just like in the Greek, God often speaks about what we are guilty of in different ways. The word transgression, as it's translated there from the Hebrew, literally means, and rightly could be translated, our rebellions. Again, you can look back to the Garden of Eden. You can look at any three-year-old having a temper tantrum. No, it's time to go to bed. I don't want to! We look at next time you see a little one putting up a fit in a store or you have fond memories of your It also leads you down another topic from Bible study this morning. It leads you down the path of not being content and not really realizing how blessed you are with what God has already given you. But I don't want to! Transgression. Rebellion. All those times, and there's not a single one of us in this room, and there's not a single one of us in this world who can honestly say to one another, let alone say to God, oh, I've never done that. That's who we are. That's our sinful flesh. And even... Just who I am for my own sake. Which then leads us to that wonderful truth that even though we don't deserve it, our relationship with God because of who He is, because He is who He is, is that we are people who are looked upon as holy and perfect in His sight because of Jesus Christ. That as precious as we would envision ourselves looking upon the Christ child, 
Again, we've had so many opportunities, Living Nativity, preschool program, kids church program, even with the Christmas Eve service and Christmas Day service depicted with the manger up in front, still here on the banner, as much as we would just envision looking upon Jesus, imagine ourselves as the shepherds, as the wise men, as Simeon or Anna in the temple. Imagine ourselves just looking at the Christ child and realizing who he is and how just precious and we would just be filled with, oh, this is so wonderful. Take that feeling, that thought, multiply it by a gazillion. And that's how God looks upon us. His people who trust in Him, who worship Him, who respect Him, and say, yes, He is my Lord. And that's the status that we have that guarantees that when we stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, we're not going... My relationship with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was brought home to me this past week when just in kind of a casual conversation somehow it turned to the topic of religion and Christmas and Jesus, which I guess is, is understandable this time of year. And someone asked the question, what would you do if Jesus showed up at your doorstep? What would you do if he walked into your living room? When I thought about it, my answer was, I would fall at his feet and humbly worship him. Because I realize just exactly how many sins I understand and appreciate exactly what he did for me and how much I This is also what I would expect to happen. Because I see examples of it in Scripture. It's, it's proclaimed. It's Evaluation, inventory, whether it's reviewing old goals and setting new ones or whatever it is, counting washers and taking inventory, that's what we do this time of year. I pray that that's what we do today and every day of our lives as Christians. Let's take stock, let's take inventory of just exactly who God is, just exactly who we are. And just exactly what our relationship with him is. What a wonderful truth is, that it is that God is exactly who he is. Yes, the creator. Yes, the judge. Yes, the authoritarian. Yes, the one who makes the rules and says what is right and what is wrong. He also is the one who is merciful, loving, and compassionate. And he has blotted out our transgressions and he remembers our sins no more. That was accomplished through the sending of his son to be our savior. And because of who he is and what he has done for us, we are who we are. A people of God, precious and holy in his sight. May the Lord continue to give us the blessing of knowing those truths 
and living in those truths now and forever. Amen.